Thanks for inviting me here in your midst for this very important occasion. Facts and truth. What are we doing? We are trying to observe ourselves. And when we try to observe ourselves, we do it through all the wards, through all the biases, through all the tinted glasses. So therefore, the vision that we get is always going to be tinted. So how do we decipher? And what I'm trying to say here is that intrinsically, there's a current purpose that society has within which it tries to define facts and the truth. So there's a kind of a political and the social purpose that is there. Now, facts are of two kinds. You know, I'm speaking here in this hall. There is a speaker here. There are chairs here. That's one kind of fact. But there are a much larger set of facts. Because what I'm talking about is hard information. That there's a speaker nobody disagrees with. But there are other facts. What is that? We say India has been enslaved for a thousand years. Now, people will dispute that. Whether it's 1,000 years or 200 years or how many hundred years, it's a disputable thing. So it's not a hard fact like that. We also say we want to decolonize the Indian mind because we've been colonized for 1,000 years. But what does that mean? Decolonization, are we going to restart going back 1,000 years and start generating new knowledge? And forget about the knowledge that's been generated in the 1,000 years? Are we going to reinvent the wheel? How far back do we go? So therefore, in a sense, what I'm trying to argue is that the different kinds of facts and the reality is different, and therefore the truth is different. And we need to understand that. <coughs> so my argument is that the reality is layered. It's not as if there's one reality. We need to go deeper and deeper into it to try and understand what lies under it. And therefore, we're searching for truth. It's not as if it's all given at one level. So for instance, it was said earlier, because that's our perception, that the sun rises and sets. So it seems to be going around us. Galileo tried to say, no, it's the earth which goes around the sun, not the other way around. And the earth rotating around its axis is what causes the day and night, right? So the seasons come from the rotation around the sun, the day and night come from the rotation around the axis. Perceptions change as we perceive more and more interconnections between facts. So it's not that the, you know, it's independent of the interconnections. So for instance, the nature of production in an economy. We see agriculture, industry, and so on and so forth. The interrelationship between them as we discover more and more, those facts change and the nature of the economy changes, the nature of the production, and therefore the GDP that we measure, that also changes. Then, relevance of Gandhi. Some people say, with changes in technology, Gandhi is not relevant. But today, with climate change, now many people are beginning to say, it's Gandhi who's going to be relevant for the coming ages. Because why? Because he gave principles that are relevant for today. Whether it be voluntary poverty, the last person first, and things like that, you know. So therefore, the perceptions change. Now, when perceptions change, there's also social conflict. So for instance, Ram is an incarnation of God Vishnu. But some people say that there's a mythical figure in an epic. So you can have different perceptions about Ram. In Christianity and Islam, you have a prophet whose existence was historically given. And yet you have different interpretations which lead to different sects and denominations coming up in Islam and in Christianity. You know? So therefore, in a sense, human consciousness, how does it come about? That becomes a crucial question. Because we can have for the same thing many kinds of interpretations. So there's a multiplicity of consciousness. 
this multiplicity of consciousness is something that we need to understand. There's an immediate consciousness that we each individual has. Then there's a collectivity around us, our family and so on. And that is important. That creates a consciousness which is distinct from the individual. Then there's a social consciousness, the wider consciousness. You know, as a society, the society could be national, could be global. And that affects our consciousness. You know, what are the things? And then a consciousness based on nature. Nature gives us consciousness of a variety of things which interact with each other. And therefore, all these four, they create the totality of the wider consciousness within which we exist. The social is beyond the immediate surrounding that the individual experiences. So that becomes a wider consciousness. So the consciousness is what enables us to perceive the facts and the truth. Okay, so societal and individual perceptions of facts, you know, that is something that we need to understand well. So often individuals perceive facts at variance with the social facts. What society says and what the individual perceives, they can be very different. So for instance, the idea of democracy, what an individual perceives to be democracy and what society perceives to be democracy, they can be very different. Or gender equality is another issue where the individual and the social differ. So the individual and the social perception differ. Then in sciences, the world appears largely to be Newtonian because that's our day-to-day -day experience. However, underlying that is the relativistic and the quantum experience. The relativistic says things are relative in different frames, you know. Relativistic mechanics does not bring about uncertainty. There's no uncertainty associated with it. It's associated in the quantum mechanics. Quantum is what brings about uncertainty. So there are different perceptions that underlie the Newtonian. Now, all facts are inaccessible at any given point of time because there are too many of them. So we therefore perceive only some part of the facts and our perceptions are based on that part of the facts that we perceive. We don't perceive all of them all at the same time. We are keeping on finding new facts. And that's why there are differences in perception uh, of truth in society. So there's an evolving social consciousness. What is this evolving social consciousness? That's the point to be made. And that is, we have transited according to certain people from a tribal society to a feudal society to a capitalist society, and we don't know what we may transit to. So the consciousness relates to the kind of social organization that we are in, whether we are a tribal society or a feudal society or a capitalist society. So the consciousness links up to the organization and the individual's place in that organization. So independent of that, we don't have a wider consciousness. So fundamentals of society have changed with each of these phases from tribal to uh, you know, to uh, feudal, to capitalist. Now, what kind of things have changed? The nature of exploitation. What we think is exploitation, each one of that uh, changes. The notion of freedom. And capitalism itself says that we are democratic and we are a natural thing. But this is contested. Whether we are natural, uh, whether capitalism is natural, and whether it is democratic. So as a result of these different perceptions, there's an existence of different schools of thought. So within capitalism, you have different schools of thought trying to explain what the facts are and what the truth is. Similarly, the natural consciousness is also evolving. The natural consciousness we see has changed from Newtonian to relativistic to quantum. So under the relativistic one, now space-time has become the spa same. In the Newtonian mechanics, space and time are different. But now space-time is a four-dimensional entity. And later on, when uh, Einstein came up with the general, uh, 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 general relativity, there he said matter is embedded in space-time. So matter is the curvature of space-time. So it becomes one, space-time and matter. Okay? So this is how our consciousness has changed. Then we have the duality, which came with the wave and the particle nature. Okay? 
So the same thing manifests itself as a wave at times, as a particle. So the solar panel that you have up there, their light is behaving like a particle. The, if you do diffraction, then it's behaving like a wave. You know? So in interference, it behaves like a wave. So the same thing can be the polar opposite. It's possible that it's this and that, and also both simultaneously. And this change in the sciences, the para paradigm of sciences, has led to a lot of social changes. So it's not that they're independent of the social changes. Like the industrial revolution, like the air air aircraft, okay? We can travel fast and therefore changes the nature. And we begin to say that we are a global village, you know? Or with the coming of the internet, the social uh, interactions have changed. The social media has changed the interaction, changed the nature of politics. Now, governments play a very large role in creating this consciousness. What kind of thing are they? Because facts are massive, you know, micro, macro. In simpler, earlier societies, facts were few, life was simple. You could access them. But today, for an individual to access all the facts is almost impossible. The governments generate facts, you know. They, uh, they, they generate micro, macro, and then do the aggregation at the social level, at the political and the economic plane. And therefore, for policy purposes, they theorize. So theorization has become essential because otherwise there's too much facts. So this theorization then leads to what is called abstraction, the process of abstraction. Because you abstract from the facts and they theorize on the basis of that. Now, official data in India, you can see that the ruling parties glorify themselves. Therefore, what do they do? They manufacture facts or they give facts selectively. So whether it be in the context of the GDP and its growth, the government today says we are the fastest growing economy in the world. But if you actually look at the reality, we are not the fastest growing, okay? But the government needs to project that, okay? So the government gives data in a certain way. The extent of unemployment and poverty, there's massive unemployment amongst women and youth, especially the more educated youth. But that is glossed over. And when you have unemployment, then you have poverty in the family. Then there is a large amount of black income generation, which means massive illegality and policy failure. So that also impacts. Then the un unorganized sector, because we have the organized sector which employs 6% and unorganized sector which employs 94%, and this 94% gets un, uh, you know, ignored. So I call it the invisibilization of the unorganized sector. So 94% get invisibilized, but that's not in the data. Then the problems of education and health data, the quality of education, quality of health, we saw that during the pandemic. Now, what is happening is that when we do theorization on the basis of abstraction, then there's a breakdown. There's a book by Vitol Kula, he said, every model of economics has the seeds of its own failure within itself. Because it ignores a part of the reality, and therefore there's going to be a breakdown. Now, look at the way capitalism has developed, you know. Post 1980s, there's a certainty in the West that capitalism is going to survive. Soviets had, uh, were collapsing, China had taken a 180 degree turn, and therefore, the gloves were off. But profit as it was generated, massive amounts of profit that were generated, they were resulting in problem of demand. And therefore, there's a possibility of inequality rising and social breakdown. So therefore, for the survival of capitalism, it was necessary that you have safety nets. So safety nets came as a result of the kind of crisis that was there. And now we are talking about universal basic income. Because we realize that a lot of people have no income. And if there's no income, then there'd be less demand. And when there's less demand, the growth would be less. But this is a failure of capitalism. Because capitalism says you pay for work done, you don't pay for work not done. Whereas in universal basic income, you're going to pay for work not done. Now, the next issue that comes up in this context is the relationship between the observer and the observed. In social sciences and in uh, you know, uh, the natural sciences, there is an interaction between the observer and the observed. So think about the michelson molde experiment, which proved that there's no ether. So we are not in some kind of an ocean of ether, okay? And that's why the velocity of light, 
remains a constant. And that then brought about relativity. Okay? So in a sense, the nature of space-time changed with the Michelson-Morley experiment. In quantum mechanics, there is a, if you want to know where a particle is, you have to hit it with another particle. That means that particle is no more there, where, where you, the data is showing it is there. So the observer and the observed, they disturb each other. You know? And that's why the Heisenberg uncertainty principle came. Now Heisenberg uncertainty principle has a Planck's constant, which is 10 to the power minus 26. It's very tiny. But in society, the uncertainty is quadrillions upon quadrillions of times greater, but we have no uncertainty principle. So how do we study uncertainty? So economics has no method of studying dynamics, which is foolproof. We look at statics to study dynamics, okay? So in other words, economics doesn't have a way of doing that. So there are paradigm changes that occur in thought as we have tried to resolve contradictions that come up. It's not moving. Ah, okay. Then there's the nature of time. Time is treated as a parameter, okay? And what does it do? It divides up between the present on this side, past here, and the future. The past is in some form incorporated in the present. The future is uncertain. And that's what brings about the uncertainty in social sciences, that we don't have anything which is certain. So what's happening is that the past is imprecisely or incompletely perceived. The future is uncertain. So winners are writing the history. It's the winners in society who write the history. Okay? So the state is a very important player in writing history, in defining facts, and therefore telling us what our truth is. You know, so it's the state which is doing. So in conclusion, what is the place of humans? That's the important question. We are insignificant in space and time. You know, this universe is quadrillions upon quadrillions you know, of miles, even four Million, billion light years, you know, is not enough to capture its, this thing. And because of dark matter, it's expanding faster and faster. It's not collapsing. It started and is continuing to expand. We don't know enough about dark matter, okay? Uh, there is this picture of the Voyager, you know, which showing what Earth is, a tiny little dot, you know, and the Voyager has crossed the limit of the solar system, okay? Now, it's futile. Because now there's a theory of uh, multiverses. So what are multiverses? There's not one universe, but there's an infinity of universes. And the universes are all bubbling out, you know? So therefore, whatever has happened or can happen is happening in some universe, okay? So how do we know what's the truth, okay? Given the multiverse, and it is also said we are in four dimensions, three space and one time dimension, but there could be 13 dimensions or 27 dimensions, so we'd never get to know the truth of what the other nine and what the other 23 dimensions are. Because we are confined to four. So therefore, we don't know. The social, social, societal truth is undefined because it's also changing in space and time as our understanding changes, our governments change and so on. So it's all relative. And why? Because it's serving a current purpose of the ruling establishment. So consequently, Historical facts and our perception of truth are not immutable. They're changing as the systems change, as organizations change and so on. And they depend strongly on the state and its goals. So the question is, at the natural and the social plane, is the search for truth futile? Because will we ever get to it? That's the question. Is there an absolute truth outside us, which we are trying to get at? But I believe that question cannot be answered. Thank you very much.